So thank you, Sonic Act Academy, for inviting us. Uh, we're very happy to be here. Uh, but I guess we'll go straight into what we have prepared for today. Um, yeah, so it's um, kind of a, I don't even know how to say. Um, it's not a particularly academic uh, piece of writing, despite drawing on a few sources. So just come along with us on whatever trip this is, and then we yeah. can have a chat afterwards that might make more sense Let's go for or it. less. Um, OK, so in October 2003, Ellie Raz was walking on the Dead Sea shore not far from the Ein Gedi kibbutz. Ellie, a scientist, has lived in the area since the 1970s, documenting its geological and biological transformation. On this day, he is out to document and measure a newly appeared sinkhole. Ellie drives his jeep as close to the shoreline as he can, parks, and walks down to the mm -hmm. muddy slope around where the soil meets the salty water. As Ellie measures the new sinkhole, the ground gives and he falls in. Darkness. I assumed that I was covered inside the landslide, so instinctively, I plowed upwards as hard as I could. For a moment, I thought that I have been blinded, or that this is how it is in the afterlife. But then light broke in through the thick dust and a large stain of blue sky appeared. On the top of a pile of soil and rocks, I acknowledge that I am alive, and that I can see and am healthy and intact. I was still equipped with a camera, a mobile phone, and a compass. The mobile phone was useless inside the hole. When the dusk sank down and settled below, the walls of the hole were visible, with the deep cracks in between the layers of dark soil. Climbing up the crumbling material was not an option. I was lost. As if alive, the hole would detect the slightest resistance of his body and subsume it into the subsoil and lock its sandy jaw. Ellie was thus sentenced to wait in the belly of the beast which he had studied so meticulously for years. After researching the proliferation of sinkholes, this was the very first intimate confrontation he had with the obscure thing that seemed to duplicate and reproduce like a virulent planetary skin rash. He was no longer an observer, sketching diagrams of expansion. He was now within, his body entangled with the pebbles, salt, and sand. Perhaps he was naive after all to believe that he could have treated this contamination with a cure of some sort. He attempted to console himself while the sun gradually descended over the dry mountains, casting a long shadow. He recalled his childhood friends and classmates who sat as war prisoners near Beirut and Damascus. His mind then wandered to Jonah, who was swallowed by the great Leviathan, only to wait for three long days in the darkness of the narrow belly, slowly digested before being vomited out to the shores of the biblical Nineveh, the sin city of godless thieves. He always loved that story. But this land and beast were not of the sacred holy land, but rather of its denied profanity, what Deleuze and Qatari had called a holy land, as derived from the world whole, that crackles beneath sedentary spaces, quote, transpiercing the mountains instead of scaling them, excavating the land instead of, instead of striating it, boring holes in space instead of keeping it smooth, turning the earth into Swiss cheese, end quote. Perhaps this is the punishment inflicted by a territory, a debt long overdue for the arrogance of man who sought to tame and domesticate the land while cl claiming sovereignty over it. His mood and body were slowly sinking. What time is it? His watch was broken. When the night fell, it was no longer possible to tell the hour. What is the time in a sinkhole? It seems to be a space devoid of both place and temporality, a glitch in the historical time to which Ellie belongs. The sinkhole collapses two temporal and agential scales. On the one hand, the geological scale of gradual mineral sedimentation and erosion, and on the other, the human historical scale of settler colonialism and resource extraction. Merged into the sinkhole are the milita military economic project of Jewish settler colonialism and the Israeli military occupation of the West Bank. The sinkhole consolidates numerous forces that congeal together as the figure of a necropolitical power that fosters life in the desert, 
builds the infrastructure that can sustain it, and simultaneously marks the space of imperial exception into which colonized bodies are excluded and subjected to death. In 1967, Israel occupied the West Bank and established its military presence over the Dead Sea area, previously under the control of Jordan. Ever since its military rule was set in place, Israel has been systematically annexing the strip of land around the Dead Sea by declaring and registering it as state lands. By declaring the lands as abandoned, the Israeli authorities have dispossessed Palestinians of their land, effectively depriving them of the possibility of benefit, benefiting from the natural resources of the Dead Sea while monitoring their movement and access to the shoreline. The supposed absence of life in the area was used as a pretext by settler colonialism for the confiscation of Palestinian lands. In the Zionist imagination, the desert could be transformed into flourishing arable lands, and Jewish settlements in kibbutzim used agricultural development as a colonial strategy of claiming territory. The rapid development of settlements meant that the scarce water sources available in the extreme desert terrain were circumvented to facilitate the irrigation of palm groves within Jewish settlements leading to the dropping of the sea level and consequently the creation of sinkholes. Eating away the palm grove, um, crackling beneath abandoned hotels and puncturing deep holes in the desert roads, sinkholes are the environment's refusal to be complicit with the slicing, cutting, fragmenting, cultivating, farming and confiscating of land and territory. Making the land uninhabitable in the future, the sinkhole appears as both visible symptom and active cause of this colonial project's failure to instrumentalize life. The sinkhole appears when life is forced into the environment to the point of death. <clears throat> Since the occupation's beginning, Israel has implemented harsh restri restrictions on the planning of any construction in the northern areas of the Dead Sea, severely hindering the ability of Palestinians to access their land and gain profit from the natural resources. Though control of the surface territory of the West Bank was given to the Palestinian Authority in 1995, Israel retained control over the subterranean volume beneath, thus allowing private companies in Israel to develop industry by the Dead Sea, leading to the depletion of minerals and falling sea level that caused sinkholes. In the figure of the sinkhole, the horizontal plane of territorial politics and human habitation and the vertical plane of geological materiality and resource capitalism collapse into each other. The sinkhole appears as the surface collapses into the subterranean, and with that collapses the possibility of considering territory merely as surface. The sinkhole is an animated hole, the semi-living with the lifespan of geological scales. This hole, not an object nor entity, has a life of its own. What is a hole? <laughs> a hole in the wall is not made out of the shadow you see, nor of the air that is inside it, nor of the plaster and bits of paint that have fallen on the floor. A hole, rather, is a superficial phenomenon, meaning it is an interruption in the surface of an otherwise continuous object. Surface is understood here as the first part of a material object to come into contact with the object's environment. Surface delineates the form of the object by enveloping it, and thus defines the inside and the outside of the object. An appearance of a hole presupposes the existence of a surface that can be breached, reconfiguring the relationship of inside and outside. In this way, holes are parasitic of their hosts. A hole is neither a location nor a presence. It is uncertain whether a hole really occupies the place where it's localized. In fact, it seems that there is a hole there just in so far as nothing occupies that place. A hole, then, is an active presence of an absence. In approaching this, uh, the sinkhole filmically, we wanted to formally interpret the complexities of the play of surface and depth present in the landscape itself, which includes the dynamics of capitalism and natural resources, of colonialism and territorial volume, of horizontal and vertical planes, of looking across a terrain and cutting through it. What are the ways in which the surface of a cinematic image could reveal its depth? And how could formal filmic elements be mobilized to visualize the agency of the depth of the landscape um, other than uh, through what is made visible on its surface? Mm -hmm. yeah. 
as the landscape by the Dead Seashore becomes a nexus of the intersection of politics and materiality, prospecting and instability, infrastructural violence and env environmental violence, horizontal and vertical planes. So in our use of the camera, we attempted to visually interact with each element on its own terms. Infrastructural elements of the landscape, such as roads and electric pillars that permeate the otherwise empty Judean desert, are shot from a tripod with a wide lens, visually echoing the instrumentalizing and quantifying approach to space. When viewed in the final cut of the film, these static, stable, and wide shots gradually weave together a map of the space, giving the viewer a sense of coherent horizontal speciality. In the environment itself, sinkholes appear as interventions in this horizontal speciality and surface stability. Throughout the film, we aim to make perceptual and visceral interventions into the stability of the landscape shots to open them up to questions of verticality and destabilized depths. Though images of sinkholes do appear towards the end of the film, we primarily worked on creating destabilizing stylistic interruptions through camera work. All the images shot on the shores perforated by sinkholes are handheld. Even when we do see the sinkhole directly, a precarious feeling is created by the instability of the shots, mediated through the instability of arms and steps as we guide the camera through the landscape, through the motions of our bodies. In July, when we were there filming, the temperature around the Dead Sea never drops below body temperature. Even in the middle of the night, it stays in the high 30s, and soon after the sun comes up, it is already in the upper 40s. Shade offers little relief. The overabundant solar energy is strong enough to kill. The presence of our bodies in this landscape is only possible as mediated through fuel, so that the air conditioning of our car is powered by petrol. We counteract the solar energy with the energy produced by a fuel made out of innumerable dead prehistoric organisms decomposed by millions of years of sunlight. In death, life sediments in the geological layer as fossil fuels, which in turn are seen as non-life, as resources to be extracted and burned into the atmosphere, only to further participate in biological and chemical processes. The death of prehistoric organisms powers the engines of our car and keeps us alive. We leave the car for only a few minutes at a time. We take a shot and we run back in to cool our faces in the camera. The engine and the camera are as much intruders in the environment as we are. The engine is enabled by, and the camera enables, the production of fossilized sunlight. Both photographic images, in the sense that they are captured light, and fossil fuels, in the sense that they are compressed energy derived from fossilized sunlight, can be thought of as fossilized light. We have to take off our sunglasses to accurately set the exposure on the camera, and the sun blinds us. It burns our skin. The sea offers little relief. It is thick and hot, almost too hot to enter. The water is so salty that it burns the skin. We feel the outlines of our bodies very distinctly. It is so thick and salty that it rejects our bodies, pushing them to its surface. In this landscape, the water casts out the living body and the earth subsumes it. The water, with its high mineral content, does not support life and the ground kills. They operate in different registers of life, non-life and life, death. In this landscape, the liminal zones between both life, non-life, and life, death are iteratively negotiated, just as a distinction between the absencing of life by non-life and by death is constantly re-articulated. <clears throat> While various institutional mechanisms were set in place to monitor bodies around the Dead Sea and to limit the livelihood of some, and while the attempts to instrumentalize life through agriculture have, in fact, expedited its decay. The Dead Sea was reimagined by the Israeli state and private companies as the ultimate source of life, rebranded as the desert oasis to attract local and international tourists and to normalize the Israeli military rule. Israeli settlements located on the northern shorelines of the Dead Sea are deeply involved in the extraction of raw min minerals for a booming cosmetic industry. The mineral mud extract, extracted and processed by Israeli companies along the shoreline was thought to have rare healing capacities that can cure unforeseen skin diseases. Vitality and youth were proven to be a lucrative business. 
The tanned bodies that float on the oily water of the Dead Sea wear mud on their skin as a token of life. While the Dead Sea mud is subsumed into the pores of the skin of people worldwide, it facilitates the formation of pores in the surface of the Dead Sea landscape, which subsume people. The definition of life as self-directed biochemical activity only stands, as Elizabeth Povinelli writes, I quote, from the standpoint of the organism's so-called final membrane, a membrane that links and separates it from its environment. The final membrane of the individual human is usually thought of and experienced as skin, end of quote. Life and non-life are only differentiated in the scale of our perception if if the scale of our perception is confined to the skin. The mutual metabolism of subsumption between life and non-life, as established between the landscape and the bodies on the Dead Sea shore, operates not only by shifting the scale beyond the confines of the skin of a single individual, but also by shifting the scale of what we understand by skin. As well as the feeling of groundlessness and of vertigo created by the increasingly abstracted and visceral handheld shots of the ground, we aim to create a feeling of entering the vertical dimension of the landscape by penetrating its surface into its depth. In a scene on the beach, the camera enters the water alongside bodies and performs a circumnavigation of floating bodies as if they were geographies. The camera travels in such proximity to the bodies, their weight supported by the salinity of the water, so as to render them abstract. The camera continuously breaks the surface of the water. As it emerges and submerges, we become, as viewers, witnesses to the vertical dimension of the landscape, the above and below, and the permeable nature of the surface that separates them. In cutting the landscape vertically, this camera movement reveals the surface of the water to be perpendicular to the surface of the screen. Recognizing the screen as being viscerally and materially on a perpendicular axis to the surface of the landscape creates depth and dimensionality in a way very different to that of perspectival images. These images activate the surface of the screen as a material surface of the three-dimensional environment, rather than merely an immaterial window onto it in the way of traditional perspectival images. This is an image that cuts through the landscape instead of gazing at its ex expanse. There's no reception inside the sinkhole. A smartphone is dumbed down to function only as a camera. This meant that Ellie, the, geolo the geologist, could not have called for help. Instead, he turned the camera onto himself. This wasn't only his first selfie inside a sinkhole, but his first selfie ever. This selfie was to be his death mask, a last effigy in case he dies. It did, indeed, only when the face is turned into its own mask can it become and remain entirely an image. And this image can represent a presence that can only emerge through the absence of that which it represents. This selfie, Ellie intuitively recognized, would become a mask preserving life in death. It would be, as photographic images always are, a substitution for that which is already gone. Ellie snaps a second image. <clears throat> From within this living grave, he looks up through the hole to the skies above. The gaping shaft of the sinkhole is thus turned into an aperture, while Ellie is deep in the obscure chambers of a large camera. This camera, however, can only snap, can only snap glimpses of the sky. The desert, the kibbutz, and his home are absent from that image. This would have been his last picture, an image of a hole. A hole punctures photographic negatives to render them useless. This technique, often employed by the Zionist archives, was labeled killing images. The photographs stored at the Zionist archive document the project of settling the Jordan Valley and the lands around the Dead Sea. They are devoted to narrating the landscape of the Judean desert by weaving into them patterns of Jewish life. Irrigation systems, tractors, horses, factories, palm trees, and most significantly, human bodies, the settlers that labor, bathe, and rest under the scorching sun of a mid-20th century summer. The oft-quoted Zionist phrase, a land without a people for a people without a land, encapsulate a profound failure or refusal to see the environment as it was and to include within it 
the political agency of the native Palestinian inhabitants. Is that also a hole? A hole in the plot? A hole in the image? Photographs with their indexical facility, facticity, do not only show spaces and places. More significantly, they are also harnessed as visible evidence that tie human ownership to land. Looking at photographs of the Dead Sea, one might say, the settlers were there, while others were absent from the image. One might say, we see ourselves in the land, therefore it is ours. Representation is, after all, inextricably linked to the existence of life, even after its decay and disappearance. It is bound up with traces of existence and eventually with a claim to historical belonging. <clears throat> but this archive is an archive of holes. I quote from Arlette Farge, this ar the archive is not a stock from which we draw for pleasure. It is constantly a lack, end of quote. It is essentially about the lack in between the artifacts that, hold, that it holds. These lurking lacks and holes divert our, in our interest from what we see in the images towards the way the images were made and the narrative that they sought to support. Once lack sneaks back into the image, the stability of solid narratives begins to crumble, or shall we say, collapse, exposing a vacuum of meaning that had always been lurking below. This vacuum, so vigorously concealed, can no longer remain outside of the picture. It reappears as a whole. The holes punctures, the holes punctured in the representation are slowly migrating to the object of reference, the landscape itself. That is, killed images become killed landscapes, with holes and lacks puncturing their surface. The sinkhole is that lack, not merely a lack of matter or soil, but an archival lack that punches holes into the stability of the historical narrative. If history, as the Zionist archives demonstrate, leans on a representational re regime that aims to signify the landscape and the humans that dwell within, the, the sinkhole defies clear signification and threatens linear history with a discrepancy, an interruption, or a plot hole. The sinkhole makes the invisible visible and as such is imbued with political agency. The shores of the Dead Sea were once a pivotal image for the visuality of the state and the project of inhabiting the environment. Today, they are decimated with lacks that attest to the failure to force foreign life forms into the ecology and to systematically erase and conceal indigenous populations, the failure of a constructed history. Sinkholes render the absence horrifically present, revealing the state's perpetual violence towards both humans and the environment. In fact, as the presence of pure absence, they challenge history with alternative narratives that are no longer maintained by any human author. They open a gateway to both the distant past um, and the prospective future that together swallow up meaning and force us to face a lacunary whole. I started writing farewell letters to my family. The writing gives me the feeling that I can talk to someone, the characters appearing before my eyes to give me comfort. I am writing with the feeling that no one will ever read the letter besides my family, should my body ever be found. In the meantime, the air is getting thicker and the heat gradually intensifies. Of course, the one water bottle I have with me was left in the Jeep. From time to time, a light rain of dust and pebbles falls on my head. I know that this could cause a larger landslide. The writing soothes me, but I try not to move at all. The question is how to survive. I think about the stories often broadcasted on television about soldiers who survived the war, isolated and lost. Of course, there's no comparison. I'm healthy and intact. My home is not far, and someone will soon come to pull me out. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much for this talk and for the wonderful film. It was a pleasure to see a premiere of it. Um, maybe you can, we can start with the uh, a little bit of a background story of the film. How did it start, or how did your collaboration on it start? How did you start to work with it? And how did you find the scientist? Do you wanna? Oh. oh, is this, yeah. Um, I guess it's the horizontal and vertical planes that collapse 
in the sinkhole that we spoke about just now also in a way collapse our two um, strands of research, um, where mine is to do with, um, I guess, the interaction between humanity and geological cycles um, and how that can be, if not represented, but somehow approached in a visual way in order to be able to know how to traverse this relationship towards a less violent futurity. And then Daniel. Yeah. So yeah, like Sasha was saying, I think um, the sinkhole as a, as a symptom kind of, I think, um, encapsulates uh, both of our research. My own research is basically a deal with uh, the um, integration of media into warfare in the Israeli-Palestinian context, where I'm also from originally. Um, and kind of thinking about uh, strategies of making <clears throat> the, Israeli t the Israeli occupation uh, visible, um, both through archive material, that is going through the Zionist archives and military archives, etc., but also through um, thinking what are the assemblages, not only images, that is bodies, environments, um, that can either make something visible or in fact conceal it. So yeah, so Sasha's uh, films, in a way, were an inspiration for me, because I, tell, I felt that um, they really, I mean, strategies that are really capable of making something um, sensible, not, not only visible. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess this is something that unites both our work as this idea of the limits of the visible and how that's um, articulated and how there's power dynamics involved in that and technological limits involved in that, um, willingness to see, um, et cetera. And in my case, it's um, more in the context of things that are invisible to the human eye, be it by their, um, so like I made a film about asbestos before this one. Um, um, but yeah, the kind the of the ethics of, the of visibility. system also, which we showed last year, the stability of the system. Yeah. Um, I guess, yeah, and with the, oh. just and, and so the, mm -hmm. the collaboration, I guess, started also through just the mud somehow. Mm -hmm. The mud as a product. Mm -hmm. This mud, you may uh, know, it's a kind of a product that's being distributed all around the world. Um, promises youth, health, etc. But it's also extracted from a very specific territory, which is in the West Bank, basically. The shoreline. Um, of the Dead Sea, two-thirds of the shoreline are basically in the West Bank, um, supposedly under Palestinian authority, but under um, the, uh, the control of the Israeli military. So through that mad, I think somehow these connections suddenly appeared. I somehow um, got really obsessed with this um, very kind of far-fetched speculative metabolism between bodies and land and that environment where the land was being subsumed into skin in the form of that mud, and meanwhile bodies were being subsumed into the pores mm. in the landscape as part of kind of a, yeah, a singular process that where causality flows both ways somehow. And you found the scientist? So yeah, preparing to make that film, we started the research, I think, uh, initially we wanted, to, we, you can't really approach those sinkholes well, legally, without some sort of, uh, you know, guidance. Mm -hmm. And he is the expert to take out expeditions, you know, to, to watch and kind of examine sinkholes. In fact, it's, a, it's now turning into this uh, tourist attraction. So the actual... S sinkhole tourism. Destruction, yeah, sinkhole tourism, exactly. So, the, so he is the, the address uh, when it comes to that. But mm -hmm. uh, then he was also, you know, he had those stories, particularly the story of falling into a sinkhole being in a sinkhole as the kind of main trope, I think, that we thought to, to use and to play with, yeah. So the film, of course, deals with the, the notion of absence. You, you mentioned it. So there is an, the sinkhole in itself is an absence. And then we you know, have the absence of images. So we see a lot of the, the black screen also. The absence of uh, accountability and so on. Uh, how can one capture as, uh, absence on film? Um, with the absence of people. Go no, for it. No, no, go ahead. Um, <laughs> Short concept. Yeah, so one of, one of the, um, you know, in, one of the things that 
are immediately, I think, made um, perceptible about this area. So in fact, it allows certain people to reach the shore, but others are denied. When I say others, I mean Palestinians that are basically living around. So absence is layered here, um, because obviously you have the absence of the indigenous population, the absence of those who, um, who actually, um, you know, who own the land in many ways. Um, but then again, there's, I, I feel that there's some sort of obstacle in trying to represent that conflict, something that I've been trying to do uh, in many ways, uh, without incorporating that lack, which I think is inherent to the, to the very attempt to capture, uh, particularly around that territorial kind of politics. So absence, um, you know, how do we um, actually make absence uh, visible? I think, well, the sinkhole becomes here more than a symptom, also a metaphor, I think. This kind of switch from the symptom to the metaphor. But yeah, maybe, yeah. Um, well, I think it's, it's more than that. It's both symptom and cause yeah. of the processes that have now been set in motion. But for the purposes of this project, yeah, also a metaphor for an absence that is um, unrepresentable. Um, but also I was thinking somehow, uh, just watching it now with that second absence of images, um, with that kind of prophetic declaration about the future, this kind of idea of how, um, you know, as much as the depth of the landscape is invisible apart from what's made visible by the surface, which is something that's, you know, disrupted by a sinkhole. So as well as being an absence, of course, it somehow is a, may, a way of making visible something that's kept um, underneath. But how, how also, because the future is the invisible as well. Um, yeah. And that's something that I think played into that absence of image and how obviously they speak to each other that uh, being inside the sinkhole and being, um, yeah, and projecting into the future can speak to each other in these opposite temporal registers mm -hmm. almost, where, uh, yeah. yeah. No, just to add one, one thing. Uh, I, I think we both thought about the sinkhole as also literally this portal that kind of cu cuts across the territory. And you know, if you think about surveying or surveilling the land, this kind of two-dimensional images uh, that are usually um, are kind of presented as maps. Here you have an actual figure that cuts through this two-dimensional landscape and really opens up the question of, of sovereignty, particularly this, this subterrain, uh, as the question, you know, here we have all kinds of legal loopholes to whom um, belongs this, you know, soil, the subterrain. Uh, this is a cluster of kind of legal, uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, to think about this um, vertical line that goes in. Yeah. Uh, do we maybe have a question from the audience or a comment? How about these men <laughs> That's uh, a good question. <laughs> um, very kind of prosaic, I guess, uh, solution. Somebody came by and um, rescued him uh, after, <laughs> yeah, after. Yeah. How long was he in the hole? No, he was there for nine hours. Um, Enough Unlike, to make a selfie. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it was really not far away from where he lived. Um, and there was a kind of celebration um, mm -hmm. happening. And people had realized that he was missing. And the whole kibbutz apparently had gone out looking for him on the beach. Um, and that's how he was found. But also, he's kind of this, it's, it's, yeah, he's kind of this, you know, around um, the kibbutzim where he uh, lives, he's, he's known to be this false prophet because he's constantly going around, you know, saying this land is going to be, you know, basically sunk, basically uh, seminated with holes. Uh, of course, the local um, kibbutzim and, and, and tourist compounds, they prefer not to accept that um, prophecy. Uh, what is the connection of, what, of his prophecy and the, the prophecy of that guy who we see living in the light? Yeah. Well, in a weird sort of way, when we spoke to that guy, and of course we didn't know what he was going to say. Yeah. Um, and even though it was colored with so much um, spirituality from uh, all different, um, of all different flavors, 
he also seemed to have a lot more of a grasp on the material reality than anyone else that we had spoken to. Mm -hmm. um, in the, and kind of the reason that some characters appear in the film is because who is able to be on the land right now or chooses to be there is very relevant to everything that we're talking about. And this is why those uh, four settlers made it into the film because they happened to be in the space when we were there. Um, and so choosing to go to these places is a very specific kind of um, act, and, but not everyone has that choice also. But in any case, when, um, yeah, we were kind of blown away by he, how he was the only one um, even contemplating things like global warming and environmental exactly. devastation, and despite everyone probably thinking that he's a false prophet, yeah. he was the only one who um, was actually saying something that was grounded in reality. Mm -hmm. And, and likewise, um, Ellie, the geologist, um, and yet, despite him being a scientist and um, mm -hmm. a local kind of known um, figure, uh, people also won't listen. Do we maybe have more questions? Susan? Thank you. Um, yes, I, I guess I'm trying to um, think through the points that you've made around absence, and I. I guess I would like to push you a little bit on that because it's it's hard for me to conceptualize um, a sort of a narr an insistent narrative of absence in the face of um, settler colonial violence in which absence becomes the logic by which we don't actually see a certain sort of subject that's a subject that's the subject of colonial rule, violence, eradication, genocide, etc. And of course, I know that Daniel in particular would be very aware of all the projects that have happened by artists and theorists within the context of Israel and Palestine that have tried to insist upon the ways in which uh, traces of Palestinian presence can be discerned, but they're willfully um, rendered sort of invisible. And so I guess I wonder how the strategy of absence that you are so insistent upon actually can do the necessary political work? I mean, definitely, um, you know, I think uh, other projects, other strategies of making intelligible, intelligible making sensible, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, exposing, you know, the, um, the perpetual concealment, let's say, of uh, land grabs and confiscation is, Know, legitimate and I think it's crucial. But uh, this is not to say that, uh, you know, not to undermine these projects at all. I think, um, I think there is a question of representation here, particularly, and brings us to how the film opens, I think, kind of the still shots of the desert, of um, uh, the environment, um, but then trying to destabilize these iconic images that I think are somehow attached or complicit with, um, you know, observing or maybe even confiscating or uh, claiming the land. So, uh, yeah, I mean, your point is, um, is a good one. Uh, it's not against these strategies, but maybe um, beside them or, yeah. Any more questions? Maybe last one for me. Um, I mean, we're here, um, the film opens the discussion about uh, evidence. Um, so maybe we can talk a bit more about the landscape as evidence in, in Solarium in your film. Um, of course, the word evidence is brought up by Eli, who is a scientist, describing a debate between scientists and priests where scientists ended up having to go against their commitment to fact um, in an attempt to de defend fact from superstition. Mm -hmm. And so there's this, um, and perhaps when this first appears in the film, it's hard to say what his position is on this and what side he's narrating. Um, but this idea of fake evidences in the name of proving um, something that is true um, is a very strange uh, turn um, and is somehow not entirely irrelevant 
to this idea of um, um, the interventions in the archives, et cetera, um, trying to like establish uh, a particular narrative through um, faking evidence as opposed to as opposed to somehow circumventing evidence. Yeah, just to add to that, mm -hmm. and also maybe it's another answer to you, Susan. Um, I think that. Ellie, the, the geologist, uh, basically shows how evidence is here really kind of um, appropriated or harnessed to different kind of dispositions. That one evidence could be, you know, can support uh, theological um, kind of mystical um, notions of, of, of biblical lands. Um, a scientist would look at evidence and claim something different. And I think that these evidences, these kind of the pro proliferation of, 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 you know, fossils, objects, landscapes, is really here um, moves distributed in many different ways. And of course, you can use that to also make political claims. I think this is. But well, and in terms of absence, what the the evidence that the clerics demanded is an evidence of absence. Right, so the presence of any evidence of shells would be to undermine their project. And so trying to assert absence um, is again entirely uh, mirrored in the Zionist project of trying to assert the absence of prior inhabitants, um, but how that can then be counteracted is at question um, yeah, in the science versus religion debate of the pre previous centuries, but is like the debate, I guess, that we're trying to enter now. Um, and it's unresolved entirely, of course. Great. Any more questions, comments, quickly? No, okay. I will thank you. Thank you very much for this. Thanks. It's great. <laughs> <laughs>